Actually, Garamila Mahaka Bishin, Garamila Mahaka, thank you so much for that. I am still blown away by Una Ming, like the amount of times Gagurtar and Keshturam, so Kunasis Feder and Hoyal and Lauert, and Oa Aulam, the amount of times I'm asked how to learn the Irish language. And I have never managed to put that many interesting resources together. That was revelatory. Um, and then I'm, I'm sort of so moved by Nell's song. But yeah, so in Yov maybe the kind free Talav, free on spade, Agus fui on varaga, fui, uh, fui. So we're going to be looking at the sea, at the land, and obviously the sky. And this first thing, as Jesse said, we want to look at the ocean and the sea. And so last year, uh, Galway was European capital of culture or city of culture. And as part of that, I did a project looking at this exact thing, looking at how the Irish language explores the sea. How, how do we notice and uh, sort of understand the sea from an Irish perspective. And what I did was I started roaming the coastlines, the sea roads of Ireland, of Donegal, of Galway and of Mayo, hunting out fishermen and folklorists and asking them for the particular sea words that they knew, the words about winds, about coastal tides, just about maintaining your life and existing on the coast for eons and eons. And I had no idea how rich it was going to turn out to be. So the, the project, I gave the title of the project called Sea Tamagotchi. Sea, obviously the ocean of Fadiga, and then Tamagotchi, which is, I don't know, do you remember, the 90s, there was this little Japanese um, game where you had to keep the little, the little Japanese toy, the digital toy alive by nourishing it and nurturing it. So that was the idea. I wanted to get these words, take them back from the edge, from the coastline, from almost the edges of being forgotten and bring them back and love them. I've now gathered them all up together and I put them out on, um, on Twitter and on Instagram at, at Moncon McGann for both. And then I created a little book, uh, <laughs> a little book called Sea Tamagotchi. In fact, it was hand printed on an island, um, on Ackle Island, so um, in Red Fox Press. But my key thing was talking to the fishermen and seeing what they had to share, the insights they had to share about a way of life that's been happening on this island for, you know, maybe maybe 9,000 years since we first arrived. I guess, one of the first questions, the main questions that was gnawing at me was something that's often said about the famine, you know, the Irish famine. Why did so many people starve when there was this abundance of fish and shellfish and sea vegetables? And when the question gets all asked, people often pose it with a tone of sort of, of doubt about the abilities or even the intelligence of the coastal people who starved. And there's an account by, there's a great book about the Irish language, the psychological aspect of the Irish language called The Broken Harp by Tomás McShearmoy. And he quotes the descendant of a coffin ship survivor who we met in New York. And the, the man, the New Yorker said, the great hunger occurred because the Irish who lived on the coasts, God loved them and God helped, helped them, were so inefficient, they were so lazy and shiftless that when the potato crop failed, the poor unfortunate devils, they weren't even able to learn to fish. So this is often a colonial mindset. In any post-colonial society, we believe that we are inept, we are inadequate. So on Priyavrud Gahastigun Fechantagz Mea Fechantar Fokal Farga, the one thing I wanted to learn while looking at these coastal word, words was, was this true? Is it the fact that coastal people had no idea of their sea world, of their coastline? I guess come out a waller their father, Vurvaimach. The exact opposite is what I found out. I heard different words, words for waves, for winds, for sea fish, for shellfish, for fishing conditions. Words like bulagadon, a young coal fish, which is about five inches long, um, or, or what else, um, lussog, lus which is the back of a fish hook that is grabbed to remove the hook from the fish's mouth. There is this bewildering range of different terms that bring to life our sea world. And within these, inside of all these coastal words, there is knowledge about ecosystems, about, about the sea knowledge that was passed down to us. Words like leavador, which refers to the man who used to watch out for signs that the herrings were just under the water and they would throw a bit of lit paper into the water so that the other Sen fishermen could gather around him and know where to, to loop 
the nets around. So my fourth and shot, you know, as I say, every day I put up some of these words on, on Twitter and on Instagram, but I also made 20 little films that we were going to display on the walls of Dublin for St. Patrick's Day. This is all part of, of, of um, Galway City of Culture, the City of Culture of Galway 2020. So we made these 20 films, but what I would love to do is to share with you today, just maybe a few, maybe seven or eight of the little films that we made about individual words because they, they give such a flavor of them. And what you're gonna find is that there's one man, one particular fisherman, so far um, because of Nell and because of Una, there has been a bias, a dialect so far in this law in the Vailg in the Irish Art Center on Munster dialect. And of course, I have a Munster Irish too, and so does another of our guests later. So thankfully we're going to be hearing someone from who does not have a Munster dialect. But first I want you to, hear a little film with some of these words which gives a range of different dialects. John Darebla O'Flaherta from Cahirú in Connemara, John Baba Jack from Letter Moor out in Ceantar Ilan out in Galway, Cyril O'Flaherta from the Aran uh, Islands and a man from Donegal, Cormac Gillespie. But if Mac could play the little film, it'd be great. Do to women. No, do her. Oh, right, the do place it. of the place, the sand of banks, the, of the sand dunes. Do oh, do it here. Oh, yeah, do yeah. you do you talk exactly? Do, yeah, yeah. do you the deer well, getting carried? Well, shouldn't yeah. well, shin, uh, do we hear two women? Listen to women sound. The sound of the sea against the sand dunes. Sounds very glue in Wadiga, he'll have a rush. He'll have aged got a got a turn, got on turn, got a turn tally, not turn dini, a yuari, you got a dini go with him, you are, not turn carney, no. He'll have a motorway beyond, that means glow more, you are, you see. So you think glow is this can be used for the sound of the sea when it sounds like a yeah. sound from the yeah, earth, you're, from you're, human. You're comparing it with human sounds, the sounds made by humans. Right. Uh, at work or creating sound or making noise. Humans make noise and the sounds they create. So you'd imagine that the sea was mimicking this in anger, awaiting the change in weather. And so that glow, that sound, that noise coming from the sea could be a symbol of changing weather. That's right, it was a warning for fishermen. Bomb a very near squid. Kalamogus Muja er er Tibet most one shark. Augustus should not touch you fear, fear, top bar bomb a very near squid. Operation top bar bomb a very on the squid. Whoa, I said so in Vino Fashion or Sperna. Well, Cam, when it's Cam, we say Tanarkin of Squinna. Ach and Shin, if it's wild and white cats on the sea, we would say, Tabar Bon Ergari in the Eskida. That's white wave and, and the fisherman's garden. <laughs> nice, that's lovely. How am Lady? We shall not how am Lady. Carum lady, my dear. Carum can see. No, no, we, we, dear, the Hamai can be for Conchag of one. We are a mean a port. Hamin a port. So, for a very smooth sea, how would you say those? 
is as level as a pay to ask you how you are going to go. It was a line of ground, you can go to the port. Go to the port, yeah. As level as a pay to him, as to how much you are and the other one says, Carl Laddie. And Laddie is just, it's a thing of affection, isn't it? It's a good thing. Carl Laddie. Carl Laddie. Carl Laddie. It's not often it is in a Carl Laddie. No, 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 no
when the men were at sea and the wind dropped and the women were getting a wee bit uh, worried, they go to the well, it's just above the pier in Killen, down Killen. Mm -hmm. They went down there and what they did, they, they started to bail the water out of the well. And this was to, I think it's, I think it's in keeping with the science behind it, because you're lowering the, lowering the pressure ashore, you know. And the wind will blow in. To, to protect their fishermen out on the sea? No, to give them a fair wind home. Yeah. The name of the well in Rin the Killian near Tillin was said to have been drained by wind to conjure up a fair wind home for local seamen. Thank you for sharing those gorgeous films with us. Um, now to join Moncon Vagan, I am so pleased to welcome Patrick O'Murphy, who you just heard in some of the films we just saw. Patrick O'Murphy was born in the town of Carter by the Sea and was brought up with Irish. He's always had a great interest in old fashioned storytelling, and he has done countless speeches and recordings over the years since launching Torah Shear Culture and Language Center with his wife Catherine in 2007. At the center, he loves to tell tourists uh, history and antiquities of Kilmore or the Mullet Peninsula. Welcome, Padraig O'Murphy. <laughs> I was father just broad and down in a very new show, you know. I was a chance of a top of a wing. Uh, very thankful for you for the opportunity of being given this platform today to uh, to talk to uh, Moncon yourselves and all your other great guests. Patrick, it's for us that it's the great honor to have you. Like I was, you know, when I said about this project looking for coastal words. I am from Dublin, you know, I've sort of half a finger in West Kerry, but really I'm a Dubliner and I knew nothing. And I went to see you and basically you opened my, my eye, my mind and my heart to a whole different way of seeing the coastline. So for, for me, particularly, it's just the greatest honor to have you. And what I'd like to ask first, Patrick, is what are, what are the insights that we can learn from the from the Irish language about the coast, or are there? Is there a difference of how the Irish language talks about the coast to English? Yes, indeed. Yeah, you're quite right, uh, Manka. Um, <clears throat> first of all, there's a lot of uh, jargon and lingo uh, and dialect of its own amongst fishermen and uh, people generally who uh, worked on the shore. Something like that has never been translated into English at all. You will get a lot of this um, language among themselves. Fishermen and shore dwellers and seafarers, they speak a language of their own really when they were uh, speaking the native Irish. Fair enough, it has been translated now uh, academically and um, standardized, I suppose. But uh, if we were to converse or use a conversation or record a conversation between two or three, say people who were brought up on the shore, shoreline and uh, fishermen, uh, it would be very hard for an outsider with fluent Irish to understand a lot of the conversation. Um, so that's the way it was. It was a, they had a language of their own. And you will also find that they spoke very, very fast. So it was very hard to catch it anyway. And are there <laughs> insights in the words, Padraig? Are there insights in, the, in these Irish words that would be useful to us about knowing the coastline or knowing the sea? Um, or that you would just, just be beautiful to have? Yeah, there are so many words still uh, here amongst the um, local um, shoreline uh, dwellers and fishermen, as I said, 
uh, a lot of those words have never been recorded, to be quite honest, because amongst the modern day Irish speakers and uh, those who wish to learn the language, a lot of this is not taken into account. Um, it's not in standard use, it's not in everyday use. It's, a lot of those are words you would never have to use anymore because a lot of people have turned away from that way of life. I remember as a, as a very young boy, five or six years of age, um, being in the shore, picking shellfish, cockles, winkles, walking the strands, that sort of thing. And you grew up with this. Today, it's very hard to explain this to um, to, uh, to the generations uh, coming after us now. Very hard, very difficult. You have words like uh, column, which was mentioned there in one of your clips. Column chegla, we had. Column chegla. Now the word chegla means uh, no stone in the wind or sea. The wind would be like, the wind would be non-existent and to see um, a sheet of glass or plata or plate like we had. Uh, it was column chegl that we had. And Layahegya um, thing was when boats came in, uh, when there was no wind to drive those big boats. Uh, in the olden times when there was no no um, no engines to drive the boat, it was all sail. And uh, they would come in on what was known as Laya Hegya. Now I've so never heard of uh, Laya, L-A-I-G-H-E, Laya, or to, um, to stay, or to, um, Laya would be to, uh, to lay, mm -hmm. L-A-Y, mm -hmm. and Hegya is, um, there's various ways now you could spell that, depending on, how you heard it, I suppose, phonetically. <laughs> T H T H E I G E. I would think. T H E from my uh, pronunciation. Oh, yeah. Now I've never heard an English translation. I've yet to hear an English translation. Laya Hegya. It was a kind of lay-by, I suppose, in one of them smaller bays or inlets especially alongside uh, where we live on uh, both sides of Black Sod Bay. And um, we're on the sheltered side of the mullet on the east side. So there was quite a lot of those inlets. And uh, a lot of those boats often came in and anchored as close as possible to the mouth of one of these inlets where there was no strong current and they were always known to be on Laya Hegya. It's a bit like, so in West Kerry, we have a word, you know, Tasha Nelaine Shi, which is a bit palmodic in the lane Shi. It means flat calm. But as we see there, every, not only every county, but often different peninsulas and different districts will have totally different words that won't be used in another place. But can I ask you about two words, two of your words that either I stole or I took from you and then I put into, into the book, into see Tamagotchi. One was um, comic. Could you give a definition of comic, if I'm pronouncing it right even? Comic. Comic. Was that the word? I never know how I pronounce it right. A churning, a whirlpool or something, was it? No? No, maybe I got it wrong. Comic. But the other was, ca or cablu, or cablu, but cablu. Cablu, cablu, yeah. Cablu, cablu was this, um, I've even, this cablu is voice as you hear coming from the sea late at night. Now, on a calm night, uh, last Christmas Eve, I last heard this. That's so short, so recent. It was out here on the bay, half a mile away. There is a, a little uh, peninsula sticking out from the Cartoon Bay or Cartoon Bay here. And the tide was out in the channel. I was standing outside here in the chart part of the centre here, 
and with a lovely calm moonlit night and this cablo of talking, three or four voices chatting away in the distance. No boats, nothing, just the talking. And that was cablo. It was voices you hear in the distance um, from the sea. And that was a very common thing in olden time. Very common. There was very little made of it or said about it because it was it was a regular, regular thing. And men at sea at night often heard this quite close to me and uh, paid no attention to it. Now, it only struck me as well. I had, you know, I had no idea when I was doing this project that, but first someone, it was Mike Curran in Connemara said a vital thing, said that these words, a lot of these words are, as you said at the beginning, they're connected with actions, they're connected with ways of being on the coast. And, and when the government took away the fishing rights and when other people just chose to move to easier jobs, you know, you, you lost the activity. But in, in, a, in, in this new world, in a world where we might have to be sustainable in Ireland, where we mightn't be able to rely on engines and, and on, you know, getting our cod from Chile and our, you know, our prawns from, from Cuba, we might have to go back to the old ways of fishing. And so the, were some of the words you gave me, words like, like stopog or cur or even, even burrata, I don't know what is that burrata used in, in Akhil, but are there words that actually show us how to make use of the resources of the coastline? Like what's, what does stopog mean, if that's a word stopo. you mean? Yes, indeed. That's where the, the lobster and crayfish and crabs spawn. Um, in the in the stupo. that's at the outer reaches of the lower shore. Um, it's a it's a haven or layhega where they can come in from the deep, and they can hatch in the safe in the in the safety of those still waters, and the sunlight penetrates the water at a shallow shallower depth. So that's a spite is called the stupo. There are no big rocks. There is a sandy, stony bottom um, strand, and uh, there are slow mugs and um, uh, sea rods, as they say, and uh, all those veget vegetation, you could say, grow in there where they can feed off. And that's the stop oak. That's, what, that's, um, that's the breeding ground. And that's where the fishermen always put your fishing pots to catch lobster. No fisherman in those days ever went out on the deep to look, catch lobster. Um, I hear men now nearly go as far as rock wall to put up pots out on the deep, half a mile deep in some place. Well, that was unheard of because the lobster breeds close to the the close to the um, stop over the outer shore. So that's what this is the sort of technology that those older people possessed. They observed this. I remember being out in the boat in the olden days as a as a youngster, and where the pots was out set, I remember them looking over the gunner, looking down at the pots and the stop over and saying they've seen a lobster going into a pot or trying to get into a pot. That's the extent they went to, to make sure that they understood and learned more. Today, there would be no time to do that. And a lot of people during, during the year of collecting words, like people like John Baba Jack in Lettermore and, and John Baba um, and yourself said a lot of these words that you haven't said in maybe, you know, 30 or 40 years or sometimes yeah. more. Like there's nobody who knows these words anymore. Would, would that be fair to say? That's correct. That's correct. There is no use for them. Who do you tell? Mm. Nobody asks, and if you do tell, who's going to believe what you're talking about? They've never heard it. So it makes no sense. If it, isn't, if it, if it hasn't been recorded, or they can't read it somewhere, or it's not on some manual or instructions, everything now is done by 
manual instruction and all this kind of thing. The head is not used anymore. Those people were using brawn. It's like it was their it was their strength and their wisdom of the sea and the sea birds. And um, like uh, like John Wabber Jack and these people were saying, it's them, it's what you see on the surface of the ocean, on the waves and the action, coming in on the shore, breaking on rocks, uh, the white, the white caps on the waves, all this sort of thing. This is what they were looking out for. They, were, they weren't checking manuals or um, iPads or any of this sort of thing. And Paul Dick, what I'd like to before I pass it on back to Jesse, I just want to say that, like, I, I suppose I collected about 20 or 30 or more words from you, maybe a lot more, and they're on moncon.com. But also your website, this Trust Shear, like you have been collecting, archiving, going around recording people for 50 years. Some of that is on your website, Trust Shear, and there's an archive link connected to that, and a lot more of your recordings with Radio Nagelta. They're going back decades are available there and more will be available. So the information, thank God, thanks to your lifetime's work of recording and documenting this is there and will hopefully be put in the public in more in easier ways. Like Una was amazing at showing us Una Ming at these, the resources that are out there. But in your mind and in your collection is this vast collection that we will be able to access more and we already can. I urge people to check out Trust Shear. But I'll hand back to Jesse. Great, thank you. Um, and actually, we have just a, a few minutes here to take a few questions um, for Padraig O'Murphy or Moncon or about the Sea Tamagotchi project. Um, and you can give us your questions by looking into the bottom right hand corner of your screen. There's a little box that says Q&A. If you click on that, you can type your question in and press return to send them to us now. Um, I actually wanted to ask Padraig, um, I think a lot of people watching today would like to, to know more about your organization um, Tura Shear, and I was wondering if you could tell us just a little bit about it, or if some of us joining from New York, if we wanted to come visit you, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about it and where you're located. Yeah, uh, it is located on the um, southern end of the Mullet Peninsula, about 11 miles south of Bell Mullet Bridge, when you come onto the Mullet, the main road, the main Black Sod Road. Uh, it was established and uh, the idea came from um, Kate and myself here. Uh, there were so many old recordings and archives, and she was doing a lot of research at the time. So that all came together. And um, the old recordings, a lot of those I had here anyway from 1968, back then. And we were very lucky to get the permission of Radio Nagelta, who done wonderful work since they started 50 years ago, almost, um, collecting folklore and coming out and talking to the local people in the little townlands and villages. People who would never be heard of, we would never have their voices. Possibly 90% of those people who have never gone to the eternal reward and all we have is their voice and we are very thankful to them that we can have permission and put those up along with our own on this Kotlin or archive website which has a link to the torresheer.ie website Great, and we actually have a lot of people asking for the website and where you can find it. So I will put the website uh, both for Torres Shear and for the Sea Tamagotchi um, project into the chat here. Um, and actually, Mac informed me that we actually we can download the chat and share it with you after today's event. So just so you know, if you're not getting it all down, we will share that list with you, but we'll share that there. And I was excited to, when we when we spoke before, um, Padraig, I was excited to hear that you do language and cultural studies, but that you also help people out with genealogy in terms of, of tracing people's genealogy as well. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. It's Kate, my wife, that does that does the, um, all the genealogy and puts uh, family gatherings together. We've had so many here in the good old days, going back a year, a year and a half ago. And uh, we've had so many of them here. And uh, from across the Atlantic, we are inundated every day of the week. 
people try to connect their um, ancestors to the to the present generation. So that's ongoing, and uh, all that can be um, got through our website and connections through it. Put us here, and recordings of those people's ancestors as well remain here in the archive. Wonderful. Well, there's several people in the chat that would love love to know more. So we'll be sharing the website here with everyone. Um, there's just one question here, which is how did you, the two of you, meet each other? How did you first first meet and get to know each other? A very inquisitive person, I must say, but uh, a very practical. Uh, <laughs> very practical. Well, unfortunately or fortunately, um, I am... Um, a big fan of radio for many, many years now, and I've spoken to many, many radio stations and done programs with them. And, uh, and that's all. That's how it happened. So radio is not dead yet. Television can do a lot. Social media can do a lot. But radio can do a lot. Yes, great. The second plug for radio today. Una, Una Ming started us off with, with the radio. Um, great. And I think that in, in all of our circumstances, um, when we're all zoomed out, listening is, is, a, is a great tool always in terms of relaxing and learning. Um, so great. We have the, the website. Thank you, Wong Kun, for putting the, the website in there. And I'll also share the other websites in just a moment. So we are actually, but before, but before we, we take our little break, I just want to say one more big thank you to Padraig Murphy for joining us and also for, to his wife, lovely wife, Catherine, for helping us out today. Um, you know, we should also say Padraig also, and he's also called Pat Murphy in case you see him on Facebook or something else. He's Padraig Murphy or Pat Murphy. And he's got books, amazing books, of, like distilling all the knowledge of the coastline and all the words in English language world books with loads of Irish, which are available through his website too. They're, they're amazing resources. That's right. Yeah, there's some available yet. There's a couple of books. There is um, a old tape recordings that I've done many, many years ago. Um, there's one of the books uh, that has all this uh, transcribed so you can and translate it. So you can get in there as well and learn a bit of Irish. Wonderful. Thank you, Padrigo Murphy.